Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Welcome to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast. I'm Trent Kling for Leighton Kling, working behind the scenes. Coming up on today's show, we'll have an interview with Jim Johnson. He's the head of World Pay Merchant Solutions at FIS. He'll be joining us to discuss a couple of different reports, Global Payments Report and their Generation Pay Report. We're going to talk about how customers are paying at retailers, not only worldwide, but of course in the U.S. and what impacts that information might have for retailers planning over the next five years. We'll also discuss Bed Bath & Beyond and their latest earnings call. And in news, big real estate news in retail this week as talks of a merger between two neighborhood grocery anchored shopping center based REITs. It's a mouthful, but a reminder first that you can subscribe or like us on any podcast listening service you happen to be tuning in. One quick note, now if you're listening to this, you probably don't need to update your subscription, but we've been let known that podcasts are having a hard time updating on some pod catchers, so we've updated our feed recently. Just kind of double check, make sure you're getting all the episodes there. If not, you can simply just resubscribe. Also, you can check us out on social media at Retail Podcast on both Instagram and and Twitter. So as I mentioned, big news in the retail real estate world this week. Predominant grocery anchored shopping center operator in the U.S., at least according to us, at least the way we look at things, maybe getting larger. Show darling Kimco jointly announced with Weingarten Realty Investors this week that a $3.87 billion deal had been reached to bring together the two companies. Now, Kimco, a lot of people know who Kimco is, at least in the retail world, 400 shopping centers they own throughout North America. And realistically, because of the size of the two companies, this looks a lot more like Kimco purchasing Weingarten. It is kind of a coming together, but the prospective deal would have the combined company retain the Kimco name, headquarters, and leadership. So we're really talking about just making a new Kimco here instead of an entirely new REIT. Now, we haven't talked about Weingarten on the show previously, but they are a major force in the southern U.S. as far as grocery-anchored neighborhood centers are concerned. Currently, 159 shopping centers in their portfolio, 30 million square feet or thereabouts. Their holdings are primarily in the southern U.S., particularly in the Sun Belt. And that phrase, Sun Belt, came up a lot during prepared remarks. It was promoted heavily in the joint releases. That's a market that Kimco has tried to get into to this point and tried to really extend their geographic footprint. Kimco's got a lot, especially on the West Coast. They've got some in the Midwest and really a little bit on the East Coast as well, but they've been trying to move south in terms of some of their holdings. And like Kimco, Weingarten is big on diversification of anchor tenants. On the show recently, we discussed how no more than 5% of Kimco's rents come from any single tenant, and that would actually remain the case with the merged company because Weingarten feels the same way. They have the same goals as a company. And so the merged company, get this, no single tenant would represent 4% of the new company's gross rents, which is outstanding and astounding both at the same time. You talk about diversification. These two REITs have gotten it done over the years. Other numbers from the proposed deal include the Sunbelt and Coastal Markets, making up approximately 82% of the new firm's ABR, or annualized base rent. Anchors would account for 19.3% ABR. As we've talked about on the show, these grocery anchored centers usually have a secondary anchor and then a number of mom-and-pop stores there. Kimco is actually getting decent rent from some of these mom-and-pop stores, even though other shopping center owners are having a tough time keeping them around, and they're having a tough time for their part keeping in business during the pandemic. Over 550 shopping centers, 559 to be exact, would be held by the new REIT or the new version of Kimco. And after the deal, the new version of Kimco would have a pro forma total enterprise value of $20.5 billion. That's looking at more the value of the real estate held in the portfolio. You're looking at a market cap also of an estimated $12 billion after the merger. Now, Kimco CEO Connor Flynn 
noted in the prepared release that the company had been, as I mentioned, attempting to make inroads into major Sunbelt markets. And Weingarten's existing portfolio not only has major holdings around Houston, which is actually where they're based, but also in Miami, Phoenix, Atlanta, Orlando, all of which mentioned in the press release, all of which are seen as strong cities from a commercial real estate perspective currently. Now, Andrew Alexander, the CEO of Weingarten, noted that he feels the deal is, and I quote, compelling for shareholders, and it'll create, and once again, I quote, preeminent open-air shopping center and mixed-use REIT. Now, it would be simplifying things to say, hey, these are grocery-anchored neighborhood-based shopping centers because there are other shopping centers within both of these companies' portfolios. Not all of them are grocery-anchored. Some of them are anchored by a tenant like, for example, Ross or an Ashley Furniture Home Store. Now, we can't disagree with the second part of Alexander's quote regarding the preeminent open-air shopping center part. This deal symbolizes a perfect confluence between two REITs with a similar strategy in the marketplace, two REITs that have performed very well of late, even as others continue to struggle in terms of turning over their portfolio. Kimco was one of the first to turn over their portfolio, really, and focus on these open-air shopping centers. As a result... They've really come out a big winner over the last five years. But the first part of Alexander's quote from this press release, the compelling part for shareholders, that's the big one. Will shareholders go for this deal? Now, shareholders for both companies will need to approve the deal before it can be finalized, of course. And there may be an uphill battle for Weingarten shareholders. The deal would give Weingarten shareholders around a 29% interest in the new Kimco, so to speak. This is roughly approximate to the total number of properties Weingarten is bringing to the table for the new version of Kimco. They would be bringing in 159 of the total 559 properties. That comes out to about 28.4%. So you figure 29% interest that seems roughly fair as far as the equity stake in the new company. Now, from an objective standpoint, neither Leighton or myself are shareholders in either company. It does appear as though the scale of the new company couldn't help but portend future opportunity. If you're familiar with retail real estate and retail real estate, scale gives you leverage. And if you're not familiar with retail real estate, I'm going to tell you right now, scale gives you leverage, not only in terms of talking about economies of scale, in terms of managing the properties, but also in terms of cost of capital, which is so important for REITs or any retail real estate investor or landlord terms of getting that capital. Generally, the bigger and more successful the portfolio, the cheaper and more readily available the capital. That's not always the case, but generally the case, especially with the given success of these two companies' portfolios. It's not like we're talking about two indoor mall-based portfolios here. It's not like we're talking about a Simon necessarily, although in regards to Simon, of course, they've been trying to keep up their portfolio. But Again, Kimco, when you look at it in terms of someone that would be providing the new Kimco capital, you look at this portfolio and you see 559 properties. First, that's a lot of properties. So if one goes under, you've got 558 more to prop them up. The second thing is you can't help but look at recent real estate trends in retail. We've talked about it on the show really over the past three months or so. We've talked about it with Megan Martindale of CBRE as well. These neighborhood anchored shopping centers are becoming hubs for certain businesses to offer curbside pickup, especially with grocery, but also with some of those other secondary tenants because of their proximity to residential areas. Unlike traditional shopping centers, they really have the advantage in terms of any types of buy online pickup in store proposition as such. They're driving traffic. They're being seen as more valuable in the retail real estate world. So you would think that bringing these two companies together would make that capital cheaper and more readily available, positioning them for potential future takeovers of additional high cash flowing properties for the purpose of their investors. What does this mean from a retail perspective? Well, it helps to stabilize this space even further. When you look at smaller REITs in these spaces, you do kind of worry about, well, hey, if two properties go under and that's 5% of your portfolio... That's a little bit tougher to overcome, but with 559 shopping centers in your portfolio, if one or two are struggling, you've still got the rest to prop that up. And so that means some security, at least from a retail perspective, but also both of these companies, in particular Kimco, have a great track record at filling 
vacancies. So it could mean that, you know, hey, these, some of these shopping centers that have been seeing some of the mom and pop vacancies, maybe those evaporate because you've got national credit tenants and national credit retailers wanting to work with the likes of Kimco on some of these vacancies. Anyway, I digress. We've seen stranger things regarding shareholders potentially shooting a deal down, certainly. And although the deal is slated to close in the back half of 2021, we could see a few bumps in the road from shareholders. We doubt there will be serious SEC scrutiny surrounding the deal as the 559 properties would still represent a relatively low number, even though we talk about how big that would be for a grocery anchored REIT. It's a relatively low number for neighborhood centers in terms of when you look at the total U.S. footprint. So I don't think there's going to be an issue there, but maybe a shareholder or two, a significant shareholder of two, voices some concern about the deal. That could be a potential roadblock. Outside of that, I think certainly positive news overall if you're looking from a retail perspective at this deal. So now that we've covered our news story, let's talk with Jim Johnson, head of World Pay Merchant Solutions at FIS. Once again, he'll be joining us to discuss the Global Payments Report and the Generation Pay Report, both of which recently released by FIS. We're going to talk about how people across different groups and how people across different generational groups are paying and what that means for U.S. retailers moving forward. Every six months or so on the show, we think it's important to cover the latest information on how customers are paying retailers, both in-store and via e-commerce. And to that end, we welcome Jim Johnson today, the head of World Pay at FIS, to be joining us to discuss the Global Payments Report and the Generation Pay Report, both recently released by FIS. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Trent, thanks for having me. First, I was wondering if you could provide, just so our, our listeners kind of know the perspective that you bring here, a little bit of background about FIS and WorldPay as well, and kind of what you do on the day-to-day there. Yeah, FIS, you know, to put it simply, we kind of describe ourselves as the the largest fintech provider globally. And, you know, WorldPay is an acquisition FIS did a little less than two years ago. And I run the WorldPay business today, and we're really, you know, focused on the merchant community and providing solutions for that community to conduct commerce. Before we get into the reports, I just wanted to ask, just from a 30,000-foot view kind of here, what are some of the macro-level trends that you're seeing from your position in the industry as far as payments are concerned? You know, and some of this really manifested itself or really proved out in our global payments report recently. But I'd say if I were to kind of break it down into three pieces, first and foremost, we're clearly seeing e-commerce expand exponentially across the globe. You know, that market grew almost 20 percent last year and is expected to grow almost another 60 percent over the next three to four years. And really, Mobile e-commerce in particular is a big driver of that. And if you look at the past 12 months, you know, with the pandemic, it's clearly been the highest growth rate we've seen in the past five years. And really in one year, we actually saw almost two to three years worth of typical acceleration in the past year. So that's clearly, you know, one trend that was happening. The second one You know, a lot of people talk about digital wallets, have they reached maturity, things of that nature. They absolutely took off in the past year, right? Once again, driven by mobile commerce. And just to give you a little perspective, digital wallets actually are forecast to be the most popular online payment method by 2024. And, you know, contactless payments made via digital wallet are growing faster than actually plastic credit card payments in our in-store locations as well. So it's a vehicle that's not just being used online. We're seeing it being used increasingly in-store as well. And then as you can probably imagine, based on those first two trends I speak of, we have seen a drop in cash usage globally. You know, if we look last year, cash accounted for just about one-fifth of all in-store payments across the globe. So about 20%. And that's behind credit cards, which are 
represent about 50% of in-store payments and mobile wallets, right, that we just talked about, which are representing 26% of payments. You know, I get the question on how long is cash going to be here, things of that nature all the time. You know, I don't want to project too far into the future, but I'll say cash is going to be here for a while, but we are going to continue to see it decrease over time. And in our kind of our estimates is that over the next four years, you'll probably see it go from, you know, 20 percent of in-store payments down to probably under 15 percent during that time. So I think those are the three big things going on in our industry. So let's talk about those cash transactions, because one of the fascinating things I found with the global payments report, and I've always thought this was interesting, is cash payments differ greatly based on region and where you are throughout the globe. What did we see as far as differences regarding regions? Because as you mentioned, the number dipped to about 20%, but depending on where you are in the world, that number might be single digits or it might be a lot higher than that 20%. Yeah, without a doubt, you see some pretty big differences across the globe, Trent. You know, if I were to throw some stats at you, North America cash is a little over 20%, whereas in Europe, it's greater than a third of the transactions, right? Latin America, even a little bit greater than that. And in Asia Pacific, right, it's almost 37% of all transactions. If you look at other locations, right, in Canada, it's only 5.4% of point of sale transaction volume. Norway, it's 4.5%. And it's under 10% in diverse markets like Australia, Hong Kong, and Sweden, right? So you can see the delta there. What is for sure, though, is, you know, over the next four years, you're going to see those numbers drop dramatically, right? Where in Europe, we think it's going to get probably cut in half over that time similar in in APAC and in some of those more progressive countries, they're almost going to fall below a level that you could almost consider them cashless. So with that in mind, I wanted to go back to mobile wallets. And that's something that you brought up as is one of the major three movements that we're seeing in the industry. We talked to someone on the show last year about mobile wallets and mobile wallet adoption. And At the time, there was still some question as far as where that mobile wallet share was going to come from. We knew it was going to pick up share. We just didn't know where it was going to come from. That was certainly touched on in the global payments report. Regarding mobile wallet payments, where are these payments coming from as far as the other dividers, whether it's plastic, whether it's cash, that we've seen so far in the data? Yeah, great question, Trent. The first thing I'd like to point out and make sure is clear is that, you know, we've always kind of referred to digital wallets as an alternative payment method. What I can tell you, those days are gone, right? The popularity of the wallet is here and it's here to stay. As I mentioned before, it's really driven by the acceleration of m-commerce. And, you know, because of that, they're forecasted to become the most popular online payment method within four years, right? So, They are no longer an alternative payment. They're soon to be the preferred payment. As you look at, you know, what's it replacing, you know, as it it accounts for a third of the transactions today, we're projecting it to count more than a third of the transactions by 2024. Really, it's taking volume from credit card payments, debit card payments. I think those are the areas that will be hit. And when I say that, you have to keep in mind the wallet, it houses different type of payments in there. So it's going to replace physical credit card payments, but the payment could still be done by a credit card in the wallet in a virtual fashion. So those distinctions are sometimes really important to point out. Something that we haven't talked about yet, but it's a major section in this global payments report is loyalty as currency. And The report does a pretty good job of breaking down some of these aspects. I know mentions Designer Shoe Warehouse, Shelf Fuel Rewards Program, and and some of these other aspects. What are we seeing as far as retailers really starting up these loyalty programs, but not only starting them up, but making sure that customers see them as a form of currency and are using those loyalty programs on a regular basis? Yeah, you know, loyalty programs have, they've always been really important to card issuers and merchants alike. But really the interest in the traditional programs is starting to decline a bit and brands are really 
prioritizing reward programs that are more in sync with consumer shopping pattern and expectations. You mentioned a couple examples. I will tell you just in my personal experience as I'm doing transactions and checking out, I'm increasingly being asked, hey, do I want to use a, a set of my points to either pay for the good I'm about to get or maybe it sends off the gallon at the gas pump. But having the option to use those points in real time is really a wow factor for consumers, right? And that's really what's motivating merchants to make the changes they need to at the point of sale. And it's really kind of driving the issuers to offer programs like that. Everything today is more immediate satisfaction and, and points are no different, right? The days of you know, doing transactions on your debit card for two years and accumulating enough to buy a toaster or a TV or a a trip are declining a bit. People want to use those points the minute they start earning them. And that's really the big trend we're seeing. And consumers are absolutely adopting these things. The numbers are really strong related to consumer adoption. I think in our recent survey, 81% of consumers around the world Uh, said it would be helpful to have the ability to earn points and redeem those real time at retailers. So I think it's a aspect of loyalty programs that are going to continue to evolve and evolve very quickly. You mentioned something that I I wanted to touch on and we'll go ahead and touch on it now. But of course, you're not only involved with the, the back end of these merchant solutions, but you're also a shopper yourself. You go to various retailers Where do you think the largest area of opportunity is in your experience for retailers based on the data and based on the type of things you see on the back end? Great question. Biggest opportunity, I think, is the new generation of shoppers. They want to be able to transact with different payment methods, right? They don't want to just do transactions with their traditional debit card or credit card. They want to have the ability to do things like buy now, pay later, pay with like a direct debit from their bank account and different types of pay methods like that. So I think you're going to see the evolution of additional choice at the time of checkout, whether it be in person or online, continue to evolve in our industry. So now let's go ahead and pivot to the generation pay report. It came out a little bit earlier than the global payments report did. The report generally looks at, as the name implies, generational payment trends there. To start, what were some of the key takeaways from the data as a whole? If I could lump it into kind of three categories, I think in the COVID pandemic clearly accelerated this. You know, there is a fast growing movement of adoption to more cashless technology, right? One in three people are now using digital wallets for cashless payments with even greater usage for consumers under 55, right? So that's a big shift in payment behavior across the demographics. As I mentioned, you know, safety concerns during the COVID period have clearly, you know, accelerated and compounded the issue. We've gotten that feedback from almost 53% of the respondents in that generation pay research. And 61% of the users agree that using contactless payments is making not only shopping safer, right, but easier, which is really signaling a greater willingness to kind of make the change in their behavior. So that's item one. I would say, not to contradict what I said, but there still is a subset of folks out there who do have concerns about cashless payments, right? We did get feedback that despite the change in behaviors that two thirds of people feel more comfortable using the payment method they always have used, such as cash, check, credit card, debit card. And they cite really kind of security issues as a key driver of that thought process. And almost half of the respondents, you know, 46% to be exact, agree that not using cash makes it easier to lose control of their spending, right? They feel like they get kind of outside of their budget. So I think as you continue to see products evolve, the ability to have kind of financial management tools embedded within the cashless technology, as well as the ability to continue to 
prove out the safety and reliability of those products is going to be key to continue to drive movement towards cashless. And then the last thing I'd like to point out is that, you know, this one's kind of rings close to home for all of us. Digital content subscriptions are reaching the point of ubiquity, right? Almost 70% of our respondents across the globe have one or more digital subscriptions. And as you might expect, Gen Z, Gen Y leading the charge there with over 80% of those age groups having at least one digital subscription. And interesting too, almost 30% of the respondents subscribe to more than one digital streaming service. Um, So digital content business, good place to be right now, even with the beyond baby boomers and baby boomers, while their numbers are less, it's still, you know, significant. You mentioned something regarding the perception of safety surrounding what some generational groups might think of as atypical payment methods. Of course, digital wallets are almost going to be native to Gen Z, for example. But what are some things from a retail perspective retailers can do to not only communicate that, hey, these methods are safe to use in our stores or on our websites, but also you mentioned tracking spending and finances and that type of thing. I understand loyalty programs are doing this as well. What are some things retailers can do on that front as well to kind of convey this message that, hey, you know, we're going to be sure to communicate with you whether or not you're spending outside your means as well? Yeah, great question. I would say on the safety front, really, it's just continued education, right? Whether it's educating people on the concept of tokens, tokenization, right, that all of your information is masked, the fact that retailers are not storing any of your card data, personal data on their systems. They're just passing, right, this token through the program. I think that's key. I think also removing kind of myths and hallway conversations related to people intercepting data via near field communication, things of that nature. And I think, you know, that education is ongoing. People are getting more comfortable. But I think those are the big things to be thinking about from a retail perspective. On kind of the keeping track of your finances, I think wallets are going to continue to evolve having capability within the wallet to do personal finance management, PFM. And so you're starting to see that today with some of the wallets that are out there, but that's going to be a big evolution going forward. I would draw just a parallel with kind of, you know, what's happened with e-banking sites over time, right? It used to be If you looked at your e-banking site where you do your banking, you saw, you know, what transactions posted, you could do a bill payment. And as things evolved over time, they really do do a lot of aggregating and personal finance management types of things in those pieces of technology. I think wallets will follow a similar track. I wanted to finish the GenPay report discussion off with this. I think one of the most interesting facets of this report, we've talked throughout this about how cash use is declining amongst most age groups. But if you look at Gen Z, so the youngest age group that's covered here, 26% use cash in grocery shopping, 24% use cash in in in-store shopping, 33% use cash eating out. That's the top payment method in those three categories. And It kind of makes sense because you would think maybe a lot of Gen Z members still unbanked or maybe underbanked. As someone in the payments industry, at what point do we see younger consumers gradually begin to make the move away from cash? And how can this inform retailer decisions about kind of how they approach those age groups? Yeah, you know, in this study and in other things I've read, right, interestingly enough, those younger groups, particularly Gen Z, they're just very, very concerned and in tune with kind of keeping within their budget, right? So I think that's a big thing that is driving their cash behavior. I will tell you, though, they can be swayed to move away from cash by offering rewards, you know, by using other forms of payment. I think that goes in line with kind of their budgeting mindset that, hey, if I'm using this payment method to get rewards, that's a good use of my funds. I'm getting something in addition. So I think rewards programs and and in particular, easy to use reward programs are really going to kind of drive behavior there. And then I think social media and the ability to do more purchasing through social media, right, and being prompted in social media to do things, 
I think that's going to drive behavior towards more wallet type purchases and non-cash type purchases just because they're doing more purchasing in an electronic fashion, e-commerce type fashion. So I think those will be the big pushes as well as the thing you got to keep in mind, the Gen Z, 57% of them, as you saw in our report, 50% of Gen Z are concerned that mobile wallets are not as secure as other payment methods. So continuing to kind of fight that stereotype and that stigma will be a big factor in their movement to different methods. All right. Fantastic. Well, once again, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on today's podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. We thank Jim for joining us and you can visit the FIS website if you'd like to download either one of those reports and I highly recommend it. In particular, you know, I think the global payments report obviously contains very good information, but the generation pay report I think is just so interesting in terms of the breakdown. As I mentioned, if Gen Z putting more cash out there than just about any other generational group, something that doesn't maybe immediately come to mind when you think about how different generations pay, but it's something that retailers like, for example, Five Below, who might have an influx of Gen Z and younger consumers that they're keeping in mind because these consumers, again, oftentimes paying with cash or paying somehow with funds that are coming from a different source in the case of those younger than Gen Z. And that's a real consideration when you talk about front end dynamics at those types of stores. We're looking ahead story. As I mentioned, we're going to go a little bit longer this week as Bed Bath & Beyond released earnings this past week. And They expect a significant boost in revenue in Q1 coming up, as they should, which is what we'll talk about. But the real question is, what is this going to do for other retailers who were forced into closures during last March and April as well? And that's the crux of this looking ahead portion, but there are other facets to it as well. Again, the earnings, they were good for Bed Bath & Beyond. Credit to Mark Tritton and company posting a significant beat, 40 cents versus 28 cents against analyst expectations there. And there were a lot of interesting numbers on the call, like, for example, their digital sales. When you look at digital sales coming in for Bed Bath & Beyond, and this is something that, again, the potential was sent to be there, but they say they're on their potential now over $3 billion in terms of digital sales during fiscal 2020. But get this, only 14% of the digital sales were actually buy online, pick up and store at one of their outlets. Now, again, when you look at the entirety of fiscal 2020, you're looking at cost plus world market, you're looking at Bed Bath & Beyond, you're looking at Bye Bye Baby. Those are their three main brick and mortar brands. Of course, they shed cost plus world market back in January. So now going forward, you're looking at two really main brands, although they do have four core brands, of course, that they talk about in terms of their overall company sales as they move forward. They want to really focus on bed, bath, home, and baby, as they say. Another number that I thought was interesting, comp sales growth up 4% year over year. And again, still in pandemic conditions here, that's certainly a positive This only includes about half of holiday sales because their quarter ran from November 29th through the end of February. So I think that's interesting that they were doing well at the beginning of 2021 in terms of the calendar year. Also, for the first time, they actually broke out enterprise sales in terms of the store banners. Bed Bath & Beyond saw a 6% increase in terms of comp sales, which is a big jump for them. And I wonder if this is something they'll do more of again after that divestiture of world market to Kingswood Capital Management after that was finalized in January. In any case, we talk about these numbers and one of the things I'm looking ahead to, and this is a three to five year window. We just talked about shopping centers and neighborhood based shopping centers. Not a whole lot of bed, path and beyonds in Kimco's portfolio, but The real question for the company is going to be how effective, how purposeful are the brick and mortar stores in their portfolio? If we're seeing digital sales really grow by leaps and bounds, 
nearly doubling in terms of digital customers during fiscal 2020. Not many of these, or not as many as some other retailers, are touching stores. How much do you really look at either breaking some of the leases or not renewing some of the leases in your portfolio that's out there if people are simply just going online and shopping online for certain products? We've talked about certainly the nesting phenomenon obviously is going to help their key brand in terms of Bed Bath & Beyond, but Again, you look at two different companies in terms of home goods, for example, run by TJX. And with home goods, you have that treasure hunt aspect. You have all of that. With Bed Bath and Beyond, there wasn't ever really a treasure hunt proposition as much as the company might have wanted to think so. There was never really that proposition there. The main proposition behind going to a Bed Bath and Beyond was, again, interacting with the different products. Now, Maybe customers are getting to the point where they don't need to interact with certain products. I Myself, if I'm buying a gadget for the kitchen or a tool for the kitchen, I'm not buying one until I get a chance to handle it, until I get a chance to interact with it, and maybe I'm just a particular type. I don't know. I have about 10 chef's knives. I only use three of them, and those three are the ones that I actually got a chance to go to the store, handle, figure out how they set in my hand. The other seven I got as gifts or got online before learning my lesson there. Now, like I said, maybe I'm just ultra particular in the kitchen, but in terms of things like bath implements, in terms of things like sheets or bath towels, people may just be more trusting in terms of online orders, the color being correct, the feel being correct, and as described than they were in the past. So maybe this real estate portfolio for them and having so many stores is truly redundant based on their model. Now, that's one reason I'm looking ahead. The second reason is much more immediate and that is fiscal 2021 for Bed Bath & Beyond. They estimate that their Q1 sales, keep in mind, most of their stores closed Q1 last year. Their Q1 starts about March 1st. They expect overall reported net sales to increase by over 40% versus last year. And you think, well, that makes sense. The stores were closed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that includes the divestiture of world market. When you take that out, They expect sales to be up 65 to 70% versus the first quarter of last fiscal year. And the reason I bring this up is we see and have seen so many news articles, whether in pandemic or not, there's so much dwelling on the negative in headlines because generally that's what drives clicks. That's what drives people to read. So you've seen a lot of negativity towards this type of sector and you wonder what media coverage is going to look like, what market coverage is going to look like for those publicly traded companies when they come out and say, oh, hey, our sales were up 80% year over year. Our comp sales were up this massive amount, close to 100%. You wonder how public perception of the companies might change. And while we've talked about others like grocers and general merchandisers maybe coming up against rough comps as they anniversary all that panic buying from last year when the pandemic kind of swept in in March. You wonder if things are going to be the opposite in terms of public and media coverage of Bed Bath & Beyond and like companies. So I am really kind of curious to see how coverage of these companies, Macy's, JCPenney, those type of lightning rods that are out there, if it changes at all, And whether that changes the public's expectation of these companies and how the companies in turn will also attempt to frame these numbers that are coming up. Because Bed Bath & Beyond did a great job saying, look, hey, most of our stores were closed. This is an expected deal. But again, you'd have to think that if they come in anywhere near expected, that it's not only going to catch some people by surprise, but also impress some onlookers as well. So just a couple of things to look ahead to with regard to not only Bed Bath & Beyond, but kind of their segment that they occupy as well. Once again, we thank Jim Johnson for joining us this week. Coming up next week, we'll talk to Daniel Gold. Daniel is the founder of Future Energy Solutions, and this is a fascinating conversation. It's been one of my favorite of the year so far, and I know I say this a lot, but one of the things that is overlooked so much in retail, especially brick-and-mortar retail, of course, is lighting. And Daniel will talk about lighting dynamics in stores, how retailers can potentially save energy, but also how the dynamics surrounding lighting 
is changing and how retailers might be better off outsourcing their lighting to a third party, like Future Energy Solutions, for example, if they don't have their own lighting experts on hand. Yes, it's that important to the retail experience. Check out Daniel's conversation next week simply by subscribing to the Retail Focus podcast. However, you're listening this week, we wish you a great next seven days before that podcast comes out. This has been the Retail Focus podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.